Um, the Mox book. Yeah. So I went through the first 27 pages. Um, some of the chapters are incredibly short. Some of them are longer. So doing it a chapter at a time as I did the Young Bucks book doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I'm just going to divide it into chunks and stop when it makes sense for the day. In this case, uh, the Mox book has a really cool thing that I assume is going to be sprinkled throughout. Maybe those will be my touchstones. Who knows? But um, he calls the sections uh, Spin It Up, and he talks about music albums, like the whole album, and what it meant to him, how it fell into his life. So cool. Like, again, my here's my early impressions of the book. He makes big choices, which I really appreciate. And I have a number of standards of which I judge books in general, but wrestling books in particular. And one of them is Jeff Bailey and I were recently having a conversation about what what are the cardinal sins of wrestling books? Because we were talking about wrestling books that were absolutely horrible, um, which Jeff and I tend to do. And I said, you know, Wrestling books where the the subject of the book seems to think that I care about their life <laughs> before wrestling, um, where, where they make way too much out of something that's relatively minor. And that sounds really mean, because this is somebody writing about their life. But I didn't give a fuck about Bill Goldberg's fucking high school football career i don't fucking want to hear it um and maybe they're gleaning some kind of life lesson out of it and something that they think translates across the page but it usually didn't um the gary hart book which i'm always going to hold as the standard doesn't mean that there's a wrestling book that can't be better but there's something about that Gary Hart book that is so phenomenal. And one of the phenomenal things Gary Hart does is he sort of sets up early on. Look, you're here for wrestling stuff. I want to talk about the wrestling stuff. So this part I'm going to talk about in the beginning informs that stuff. So I'm going to go into it, but I'm going to go into it briefly. And I thought it was the best intro of a wrestling book. Um what are the wrestling books that I hold up to the to the highest, that I put on the highest level? And I know um, people that know me are going to kill me because they're going to they're gonna note one that I forgot. But um, Gary Hart book there in the, in the A-plus category. Uh, Bret Hart's book there in the A-plus category. It's so thorough and it's so honest. Um, Jericho's book. Jericho's first book, I would definitely put there. Um, a, a lot of Jericho's book is so good, it made me a fan where I was not one before. Um, not that I didn't enjoy things about his career and aspects of it, but that book connected to me. Um, you got to put Have a Nice Day There by Mankind, his first book. Each one got subsequently worse, but that first one... You know, a lot's said about how it set the standard and da 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 da. I, but I don't even look at it that way. I think that book is so great because it was the story that just needed to burst out. And the rest of his books seem to be informing who he was as he continued to get older and also to attempt to fill in the gaps that he thought he missed on his first book. But the truth is that first book um, doesn't need any kind of addition, doesn't need any kind of addendum, doesn't need any kind of George Lucasing. Um, in and of itself, it's just a great book. Like I'm looking at it right there on my shelf. Um, I would also put the death of WCW um, in that category, though it's a different kind of book. It's obviously not a biography or an autobiography, but um, I think that book is that great balance. And, and all the books that are in that top category have it to one extent or another, and that is 
there is kind of a joy reading the book and a humor reading the book. Because pro wrestling at its heart is a ridiculous activity that we've all decided has meaning. Um, and so far, I'm saying all that to say this. If you've got that top category, and then you have the bottom category of books that, um, what are the standards that make me not like a wrestling book? Um, your life outside of wrestling and, and, and your discussion of it um, and this and this artificial importance you attach to it. And again, that's a really subjective and really almost mean thing to say, but it is it's how I feel. Um, I think books that slip in and out of kayfabe in a really awkward way are really horrible. And so that usually that standard alone is like the rocks book is fucking horrible. It's horrible. It is, and, and if you're a book that is unworthy of the career that you had, um, the Rock's book, the timing of it wasn't great anyway. Like it's one of those that needed a fleshed out thing for later. But when he when he just has a whole chapter where he's speaking as the Rock character, it's fucking horrible. And that thing is so cursory and terrible. Um, the Goldberg book is uh it is awful, awful book. Um, there are the books that are disappointing, most certainly, but the Arn Anderson book is unforgivably bad, um, written almost entirely in kayfabe, and the Moolah book is really awful. These are, these are people that should have had magnificent tomes to their career. Then there's a host of disappointing wrestling books. I think the Dusty Rhodes book is incredibly disappointing because that should have been one of the greatest books ever. I think the Bill Watts book, just on a personal level, was disappointing. Now, the part where he talked about his career and all that stuff was pretty good. But another trait that a bad wrestling book, more another trait that bad wrestling books have is this idea that they're the toughest and the best. And it's another thing where the Gary Hart book just excels over almost everybody else because he addresses this head on. Like, look, like I read all these wrestling books and it's always, you know, I was the toughest and the baddest and the meanest. And and Gary Hart sort of informed something that I'm going to put in a, like, a, like a finite definition, which is if in your book there's an element of Whenever I won, it was me. And whenever I lost, it's because I was booked to lose. Your wrestling book sucks. That is the greatest litmus test there is. With that said, so far, this Mox book shows all the traits of the top and none of the traits of the bottom. If you want somebody who gets into wrestling, he gets into it right away. And then he informs his past very lightly with a very light touch in the midst of continuing to talk about wrestling. He never doesn't talk about wrestling. Um, in light of the fact that Moxley went to rehab a couple of days ago, um, and of course, wish him all the best with that, that can't help but inform this book, which is one of the things that makes it great. There is a lot of room here to take knowledge that you have and have it and see how it shapes the book. And there's mentions of alcohol in this thing. He calls himself a borderline alcoholic in his way of introducing himself to you. Um, every chapter and story in this thing is rife with him. In no way, shape, or form does this thing feel ghost-written as the Dusty Rhodes book did, as the Goldberg book did. That's another thing. Uh, a lot of the ghost-written books, um, or the ones that aren't ghost-written per se, but they're open about, it's this guy that helped write it, tend to be really terrible. And the reason is, the labor of going through the writing, which a number of the best wrestling books talk about, Jericho talks about that a lot. The process of actually having to write this book. Foley certainly talks about it. Mox talks about it too. And apparently he's not a tech guy. He's writing this thing on Renee's MacBook. And he's describing how, how, how bad he is at, at, at like 
using technology, but he does it in the context of talking about the album. His first album, by the way. Well, I'll get to that at the end since it's the last thing. Um, I read the inside of uh, book covers. I think it's an interesting way that things are presented. Um, and I'll just read an excerpt from it. Uh, first of all, that picture of fucking rules. Look at that shit. That is deathmatch wrestling. And the part of the cool thing about him is the way he just embraces that part of his career and how it informs everything. Um, I'll just read the one little paragraph. Right alongside John Moxley, as he retraces some of the highways traveled on his remarkable journey, revel in the never-before-told stories about his early life in Cincinnati, Ohio, the gritty independent wrestling scene where he cut his teeth. The complicated corporate landscape of the WWE where he bucked against authority and the rebellious upstart AEW where he won the championship in 2020 and was finally free to achieve the vision of the wrestler he always wanted to be. Uh, they're laying out the story and now you're getting to see it unfurl. And I have to say it's a really exciting book. It's exciting on the level of, yes, there's action, yes, there's, but he's very honest about his thoughts. What was going through his mind when it was clear he was going to go wrestle for New Japan after his WWE deal was? And the fact that he picked that spot to really start the book tells me he gets what who his audience is going to be, and he also gets... Talking about the thing that is freshest to you first, and then letting that un inform and then seep into the rest of what he writes. Like a good writer who understands that he's not a good writer, uh, Mox chooses to give strong impressions and then not overdo it with analogies, but Pick the ones that are the most meaningful to him. And I, I am of full cognizance and a full belief that this is his voice, which is very important, especially in a wrestling book, a business filled with fantasy and BS. Overall impressionistic things. That cover is fantastic, right? You open the and you get that. And then you just get that. I think calling the book Mox is really fantastic. Um, it sort of cuts to the chase of who he is, where if you look at Mankind's book, right, and this isn't necessarily worse or better or anything, but it, it tells you the name of his book is Mankind, Have a Nice Day, A Tale of Blood, Sweat, and Sweat Socks. That's a guy who's trying to make sure he doesn't make a mistake which really informs who Mick Foley is. And you get that through the course of his writing. He's trying to be as thorough as he possibly can. Mox is just like, ah. I mean, you can imagine the meeting, right? What do we call this thing? We could call it from, from Moxley to Ambrose and back again, the journey. Ah, that's fucking, no. <laughs> it's like, I'm Mox. Let's call it Mox. Because... He's not interested in the superfluous. That's not to say that this thing isn't detailed, but it does mean that every detail in this thing counts, not just to the reader, but to he himself. Um, the prologue, again, relatively short. Um, you could tell when things pop into his mind, he's just going to tell you about it which is also a nice thing about the book. So at the end of his prologue, he is like, Joe Claudio told me, I had a dream I swam in an or ocean of orange soda, but it was just a fantasy. Fucking ridiculous. It has nothing to do with what he just talked about, but I love it. Um, he tells you right off the bat, what his philosophy about wrestling is. And he's definitely in the camp of, I want something for, like good wrestling shows have something for everybody. 
you can see him struggling to impress uh, to express himself in the prologue. You can actually feel it when you read the words on the page. And to me, that told me what kind of book this was going to be. This is going to be a guy who is not a writer. Um, and he talks about like his lack of education. Apparently, he only got his high school equivalency like a few years ago. Though he does say, and it was so easy, I just wondered what the big deal was. Which tells you that this is a smart guy who made a decision early on that I was going to go into wrestling and I was just going to commit myself fully to it. A lot of things are shown and not told directly, which I appreciate a great deal and is honestly the, one of the most surprising things about the book, that he doesn't feel the need to explain every step of the way, as most wrestlers do, probably because they're told, you need to do that, you need to explain a little more, there's going to be people who are not into wrestling who might read this book, and he, inf- he, he addresses that audience, but he only does it briefly. Look, if you're reading this thing, you're a pro wrestling fan. And on the off chance that you're not a wrestling fan, I'll just tell you what wrestling is. And he just throws a smattering of images together. It's Broadway, it's Shakespeare, it's summer blockbusters, it's best-selling novels, soap opera, high art. Um, it's nobody, uh, but this part really struck me. And it's in the prologue. Most of the time, you don't get a lot in prologues. Um, but he tells you this, right? It's nobody's from nowhere finding a way to say to the world fuck you it's entertainment it's movies it's music it's everything say what you want but nobody who wrote a wwe book when they were in the wwe got to express themselves like that and it feels revelatory and it feels honest If you don't like wrestling already, you're probably not reading this book. But just in case you're a civilian not initiated into our world, welcome. You're going to love it. There's something for everybody. He talks about in the prologue, he actually has a stance in his prologue, which I don't know if I've ever seen in any other wrestling book outside of Gary Hart's. And And his thing is, I don't know if I've ever tried to nail down my identity before. And obviously, that that was his mindset going into writing this book. What's my identity? Who am I? What is my story? And so getting to see that unfurl as he's writing is really exciting. I would imagine he wrote this in chronological order as we're going to get it for the most part. Might have moved some things around. But I think he just, that's the impression that I'm getting already early on. Um. He, he has the first thing just called personal story. Um, and he gives you an idea of who his dad was. He talks a lot about his dad. Very little about his mom early on. Right? Or no, that's, that's the part after. Oh, shit. He finally gets into the personal story. What the fuck am I talking about? I'm sorry. Um, after the prologue, he has this great thing, which he brought up in the promo. One of his first promos where I really went, holy shit, that was great. Exceptional. We're the good guys. About his father, like his father picking him up at the police station. That was all in a promo. Here he just goes on about how his dad always informed no matter what shit they were doing. His dad was just like, just remember we're the good guys. And that will help guide you. Um, he tells this story about his dad. He goes like, how have I been AEW world champion for so long? How did I get here? What a ride it's been for 16 years. So he's telling you, I've been in wrestling for 16 years, right? Without telling you. Um, he's like, the answer is my dad, six foot three, 250 pound brick shithouse would box you if you got out of line. He's scary. Um, son, we're the good guys. No matter what happens, no matter what's going on around you, just remember we're the good guys. And he goes into all this stuff, and then later on, he goes like, "You know, it's not true. My dad's not six foot three; he's five foot nine. But you needed to hear that he was six foot three, so you would get this idea of the intimidating presence and how large he loomed in my life." And I just went, "What?" Moxley's breaking one of the fundamental rules, which he's already telling you that he's at times going to be an unreliable narrator because he's trying to give you the proper impression first, but that he'll tell you the truth about it afterwards for those that need to hear that. 
but that he's about giving you the proper impression. That's pretty heady shit. Whatever you're already telling us that you're going to be the narrator that's going to give us the truth and the proper impression of a matter over telling the nuts and bolts, every fact is true, detailed truth. That's a very strong philosophy. He may not even be aware of that fact that just telling us right off the jump, I'm not going to be a reliable narrator. I'm going to be an entertaining and impressionistic narrator. That's pretty heady shit. Again, whenever you see the alcohol references drop, and, and in the first 27 pages, he's got four of them, including calling himself basically an alcoholic. It's, it can't help but color what you're reading in, um, when I was, get, especially the higher levels of education, they call that a lens, right? You can't help, now that Mox has put himself into alcohol rehab, you can't help but see that as a lens that you're looking through when you're looking at the book. But I'll say this, those things pop out at you very readily. He's clearly going to be very honest about the things, even while he's telling you he's not going to be completely honest all the time but that he'll correct the record. Very strange, very cool. And for someone like me who, again, my educational background, for those that don't know, right? Uh, I was an English and political science major in college with philosophy and ethnic studies. My, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then my master's degree is in uh, English, specifically creative writing, which not only involved writing, but a lot of um, kind of literature analysis. You read the greats and you talked about the greats and you informed about the greats and you wrote about the greats. And then I got to the PhD level uh, before I decided to go full bore with this pro wrestling thing. So I'm, I like saying this, I'm probably the smartest dumb guy you've ever met. Uh, backup plans. He gives us brief thing about backup plans which is i didn't fucking have one and you should probably have one and i've gotten a lot of good education along the way he talks about jim ross coming to the performance center and giving them sound advice and he said and i listened to some of it <laughs> but he didn't have a backup plan and and he said for he himself ba backup plans are bullshit and again that's going to strike people as really shocking and really oh you, no no you should be responsible He's just fucking telling you what is. And then he goes right into the G. The G1. The G1. The G1. Japan. Picture of him New Japan Dojo. He talks about it and how inspiring the young guys were. And what he was like when he was 18 and then 15 years later when he walks up to the Kodokan Hall in Tokyo, how it felt, what it was like, all his fears he was feeling, how it tied into when he was with FCW before the WWE, um, the bell rings, but how did we get here? Sometimes he moves you back and forth in time to inform big moments. It reminds me of the Jericho book. Jericho book did that incredibly well, where he would set up this big moment but then he would tell you all the cool little things that led up to that moment. And then he would hit you hard with what happened in that moment. It's a very, it's a pretty complicated way to write a thing. Um, but I think it lends itself to pro wrestling very well. Because after all, if we're reading the book, we know the shit that happened. We can look up the shit that happened. We can look up the match. But it's really everything leading up to that. And it's, it's all the external things leading up to it all the events leading up to this big moment, but also what was going on in their mind. That's what we're reading the fucking book for. Mox is clearly letting us know that we're going to get all of the, all of that information. Um, just the training that he goes through 
in preparation for the G1 after he gets out of WWE because he just goes like, I'm, my body was battered and beat up and I wasn't in the shape that I should be. And I mostly did six man tags with the shield or these short matches because it's WWE. And I didn't, I knew I had to get a trick. So he gets an MMA trainer and this guy basically just fucking, they do a combination of like stuff to heal his body, but also to work him so he can work these harder, longer matches. He can become a sprinter and a marathoner. And like, it's just so great. I don't need to really go into the details, but just little things of, um, you know, he, he doesn't explain the pictures. He just puts them up of the, of the famous jackets that you get. And, uh, you can tell that I'm already, uh, and when something needs more explanation, like, you know, he hits his move. He's like, which they call the Death Rider. But then he has the little asterisk and he goes into this whole thing about the Death Rider and how it also became his nickname and where it comes from and why he thought it was so cool and all that kind of stuff. And then he goes into back to the moment you want to see, which is the night three of the G1 B block, right? Where he's talking about Ishii and like, the respect that he has for him and why and what the match was like and how it felt to reach the 20 minute mark in a match and know that he was okay. And that he could have gone 20 more that little moment of triumph. And then he talks about, <laughs> and then I like that he did this like sort of divergent thing where the black pages, where he talks about the album and he talks about Metallica Master of Puppets and how important albums are and how it's cool that his wife actually collects record albums, even though he thinks that's kind of crazy. And it and his theory about things and stuff. And that's the part where I really connected to him because he talks about how like things and stuff don't really inform him, how he at times just gives everything away. And as a guy who throughout my life, especially as a younger man, when I would move move from place to place, sometimes I would put in the clothes that I felt I needed in a bag and have a box full of the stuff that I really needed to have. And then that was it. And I left everything else behind. TVs and furniture and all that shit. And I'm just, somebody else can fucking have them. So I definitely got that mentality. And I'm wondering, now it's making me think about myself. Why the fuck am I that way? But... Early impressions of the book. I mean, I'm already talking for fucking 30 minutes. So it should tell you. Um, he's the most reliable, unreliable narrator I've ever read. And that includes the fucking masters that I've read throughout my life. Right? The best of the best. The best authors. Both modern and otherwise. When I was did my PhD, my year of PhD, um, I took like sort of a modern literature class. And at that level of the game, PhD, we're reading the absolute best people. Um, but we also read the favorite authors of the different writing teachers that I had. Mox as crazy. And again, there's the number of people that are really going to get what I'm about to say are so small. But the ones that are going to get it are going to get it. He's the most approachable version of James Joyce that I can ever remember reading anywhere. And that's a pretty high compliment. An approachable James Joyce? I don't even... Th those, that seems like an oxymoron for anybody that knows James Joyce. But the most reliable, unreliable narrator... I can ever remember reading. Um, and this thing is not going to be a snooze fest. This is not a guy who's being, he's not being indulgent about himself. He's being indulgent for you, the reader. He seems very conscious of, I want this to be, I want to write the book that I would want to read. That's the first and most indelible impression that I'm getting. And it's super cool. And he's super aware that he's got this great life. And he lets you get glimmers of it. But he also knows that he wants this thing to be fucking great. That is clear. And that desire alone makes him very likable 
as well as the most reliable, unreliable narrator I've ever read. In any case, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get this thing up. I have a feeling I'm going to get up extra early. I'm already a guy who gets up really early to try to get stuff done. But um, is this book going to be worth me getting up an extra hour early so I could read and then do these videos? Fuck yeah, it will be. Um, I hope... Uh, I, I hope these things get to you. I mean, the per, the people who bought me, I say people who bought me this book, um, wanted me to do it in this format because it's the way that I did the Bucks book. And I'm really happy to do it. I'm really happy to go on this journey. Uh, thank you for watching this and joining along with me. Do I recommend the book? Fuck yeah. If I wasn't such an old person, uh, I would have just got it digitally and I'd be plowing through it. But... I still haven't read a book digitally, which sounds unbelievable as much, somebody who still reads as much as I read. Um, yeah. In any case, have a great day. I'm going to see you tomorrow. Well, let's talk about the chapters that we're likely to get into tomorrow, and then I'll say goodbye. So the chapters that I did today, the prologue by Mox, We're the Good Guys, Backup Plan, um, and the G1, and then the... Uh, the the thing about the Metallica album and next uh, for sure we're going to get personal story fully and uh, why I won't ride a motorcycle at the very least but maybe a little farther than that because I can already tell that I'm wanting to leap ahead in this book in the same way that I did with the Young Bucks book though they're completely different ways of telling a story which is also very exciting to me in any case I'll see you tomorrow with this um Best of luck, Mox, with everything that you're going through, you and your family, um, and now your young daughter. So wild. Oh, and the, the fact that he talks about when he's writing this book, that he's about to have a kid. Um, again, just so much here to sink your teeth into. I do highly recommend the book already. Get that shit on digital and follow along with me if you want to.